Every distributed system at some point of time needs to agree upon some decision or some value. And this process is called as consensus. And here it is the meaning of consensus. And there are so many algorithms or methodologies which actually helps us to implement consensus. Some of them are Raft, Saga, Paxos, Chubby, Two-Face Commit, and uh, a newly added uh, one more methodology called as Nara and LRA. So in this video, we are going to talk more about distributed transactions because you guys learned in a couple of earlier videos uh, about more about database transactions, how it is implemented, and how different kind of logs like pessimistic and optimistic logs will actually help you to implement transactions in database and non-database uh, kind of environment. In this specific video, we are going to talk about more about distributed transaction because we learned that in database, the concept of transaction is all or nothing. Basically, when you have so many queries and updates, we treat all of them as automatic block and then we always expect all of these to pass or none of them to be executed. But think about it. If we don't have one database and we have so many queries and updates where we want to treat all of them as atomic, then how do we do about it? I hope you guys know different kind of software architectures. One is microservice architecture, one is service-oriented architecture, and the other one is monolithic architecture. Monolithic is old uh, and it is gone and service-oriented architecture is being used somewhere and the most popular one is microservice architecture. Monolithic architecture is basically is like kind of like a single bundle of all different services and it's usually in a single deployment and you basically do a vertical scaling. Whereas in service-oriented architecture, it is more of a, you know, a similar kind of services are bundled into one specific service and that itself can be scaled independently. Whereas in microservice architecture is a different variation of service-oriented architecture in which you basically, uh, the application is made of small, you know, independent or loosely coupled services. To understand transactions in microservices or transaction in distributed systems, we need to uh, take a couple of examples and then see how it used to behave in monolithic architecture and then how it behaves in microservice architecture to understand it better. So I have an example here. Um, so this is the architecture for monolithic. So, so, so this example is for monolithic architecture in which the user is trying to place an order at uh, Amazon website um, by paying some money which he has in his wallet. So we are interested in uh, transactions, right? Because the video is all about distributed transaction. In case of monolithic, it is not really distributed at all because we have one service, which is basically the Amazon website itself. So all of the services connected to one database, this particular user is trying to place an order. So what happens? The sequence diagram will explain, explain that. So when the user, uh, Maybe, for example, take ID with seven, places an order at Amazon.com, some order. So, so you'll make a call to Amazon uh, service, and this is whole of monolithic service. And then this service is going to start a transaction and does two important actions. To successfully place an order, he has to first check the balance and update the balance by deducting the price of the product. And then he has to place the order. Um, there are so these are the two uh, important you know queries which is actually happening. So before doing that, as you learned from previous um, you know videos, that we need to have a transaction because we have to treat these two queries uh, like it could be select or it could be update or it could be insert has one single unit of work to make all of this process atomic. Otherwise, there are a lot of problems which happens. Please refer to the other videos which I have made. Um, so, so we have put all of this into a transaction. So you can see I've referred it as DB transaction. So first what we do is update balance in the wallet and then second place an order or update an order into the database. So this works smoothly because it is a monolithic architecture. Nothing is going to go wrong because we have isolation. It's completely uh, atomic. So everything works fine. Suppose what happens if the user doesn't have sufficient balance in his wallet? So this is the step where we are basically updating the balance in the wallet 
that's where we actually check uh, whether he has the balance in his wallet or not. In that case, this query will definitely fail. So we basically does nothing. So because of the transaction, every previous action will basically will be rolled out and we basically doesn't commit. So nothing is going to happen. Basically the user will see an error showing that you don't have sufficient balance. So what if he has a sufficient balance, but we don't have enough products in our inventory. So in that case, we will update the balance. Remember, we haven't committed yet. We will definitely update the balance by directing the amount he was supposed to pay. And then we will try to place an order and we see that we don't have enough product in the inventory. So this particular query will fail and we don't commit and we basically roll back. So all the directed amount will be put it back to the um, in his wallet. And then again, a user will see an error showing that we don't have uh, the product in the inventory. Please check back later. So that's how it is protected. Even if two or three, um, you know, parallel transactions are going with the same user ID, but still, um, since we have started the transaction, that particular row will be kind of locked. So other transaction will be waiting until this transaction releases the lock. So the isolation is provided. So what happens in case of microservice? How do we do the same transaction in microservice? And now we have the microservice architecture for the same example. And um, as I told you, this is loosely coupled services, basically the small services which are, uh, which makes up a complete service or a complete application. So in this case, the same application has orchestrator. Basically, that's the one which basically receives the call from the user and then fires so many calls um, and then collect, collects the results and give it back to the users uh, or the API calls. So in this case, whenever user plays an order, basically um, the orchestrator calls two different API calls of our microservices. And now we have two microservices for this purpose. One is customer wallet microservices and the other one is order microservices. And they both have their own databases. They are not sharing the database, okay? So now whenever the user want to place an order, he makes a call to orchestrator and orchestrator file request to customer wallet and order, and then um, the process will take care. And let's see the sequence diagram, how exactly it happens. Now, the same customer with ID7 places an order and the orchestrator receives that call. And then the orchestrator basically makes two calls, one for customer wallet, because he needs to deduct the amount. Uh, and then he also needs to make a call to place an order or create an order to the order microservice. So now what he does, he does either fire those calls one after one or in parallel. Um, so let's consider one after one. So first it, it makes a call uh, to direct the balance and then he makes a call to create an order. So do you think this will work? This will definitely won't work because the transactions are limited to their own, uh, you know, local or individual calls of that particular microservices. The transaction is not kind of global Usually, in, if you see the monolithic, um, the earlier sequence diagram where in monolithic, we had the transaction for both of these kind of queries. Since the services are split into small, small services individually, now we can't have this one transaction for both of the calls because these two services are not sharing their database because they have their own databases because that's how microservices are built. So now the isolation is not definitely not there because when you when, the, when this first call happens, he will deduct the amount and then the create order will call will happen. By the time, what if one more my call for the same user gets into here and he sees the directed balance? Basically, still we haven't placed the order, but already the users uh, the user is uh, seeing the deducted balance and the order is still not placed. So these kind of problems are there. What if this fails? What if this fails? And who will take care of um, the failure scenarios? What if the balance was directed and then the order is failed because we didn't have enough uh, you know, products in our inventory? So who will take care of you know, rolling back the amount, whatever we directed? So this is all a little getting messed up. So how do we solve this particular problem of transactions in microservices? The concept to solve this is called as distributed transactions. And there are so many algorithms or, you know, uh, the process to make sure the transactions work in distributed systems. 
So before solving that, uh, here is a little crazy idea. So instead of doing anything, can we do something to this microservice and solve this particular problem? So yes, actually we can, right? Because see, instead of having two different databases for these two services, because we know that these two services are kind of dependent and we need a transaction. Why don't we just connect order and customer wallet to the same database? So will this work? Definitely it will work because these two are services and they both are connected to database and they should work. But this is not the ideal way of building microservices because this is anti-pattern where two different services shouldn't be connected to the same database. Instead, a couple of guys have, you know, you know, a couple of guys have violated and still go ahead and do it. It's fine, but it's not really scalable. And this is not a uh, reliable way of doing it. Um, I mean, of course, you can do whatever you would like. End of the day, the solution should be neat and it should be reliable and should be scalable and all of that. So the other techniques what people recommend is instead of having, you know, uh, two services connected to the same DB, have a replication strategy of, uh, you know, kind of like you have the two different instances of DB and they both are replicating the data between each other. And this is, uh, you know, still fine. But the only problem you see here is because of the replication, the consistency goes for a toss. In this system, the consistency will not be there. If your system doesn't need consistency, then you can do this way. Otherwise, you will have to stick with having individual databases and you should still implement the distributed transactions for microservices. So how do we really solve the distributed transactions problem? The answer is two-phase commits or Saga. So let's learn the two-phase commit first and then we'll concentrate more on Saga. So there are so many uh, people who has implemented, you know, two-phase commits in a lot of different projects and everyone has their own different opinion. Um, some says two-phase commit is not really good for microservices. Uh, some says it all depends on the use cases. Uh, personally, I haven't implemented on my projects. This is all the information I was able to collect from different blogs and sites. So I'm not going to recommend what to do, but uh, this is how we can actually solve the problems. If it really fits to your use case, definitely go ahead and implement it. If it doesn't fit it, use a different way of implementation. Maybe Saga will definitely help you. Um, if you think two-phase commit helps you, then please go ahead and implement it. Now let's understand what is two-phase commit. So, as in the name, it has two phase. That means that we have two phases to do it. So the first one is prepare, and the second one is commit. Basically, who tells you to prepare or commit? So if you remember, in the earlier diagram, we had this much, right? We had this much. So we had orchestrator, we had customer wallet uh, microservice and order microservice, and we had two different databases which are connected to individual services. Now we have introduced one new server or a you know, component called as coordinator. Now uh, for, the, for the sake of simplicity, I've written it as separate one, but in real world, this could be present in any microservice or it could be an independent service itself. So let's keep that as independent service itself. So what this coordinator does is, this is the one who actually takes care of two-phase commit. So in case of any other commits, uh, like earlier transaction commit, they are all kind of like, um, not exactly one-phase commit. They are like, uh, it's just one entity, right? So any commit happens, it happens at one shot. But in this case, the commits won't happen at once. Basically, it has two steps to do commit. One is prepare and one is commit. So how this exactly works? So let's see what happens when the user places an order to the system in the form of sequential diagram. So when the user places an order, the first thing will happen is the coordinator should first create the transaction ID because that's the ID which will be referenced to or given as a reference to all of the different microservices which the coordinator is going to talk. The first thing the coordinator does is the prepare phase and then the set commit phase. So first he has to do the prepare phase. In this case, that's the first stage, right? So in this stage, the coordinator will ask the customer wallet and also the order um, microservices to prepare their states. What that means is 
basically when coordinator asks the uh, customer wallet microservice to prepare, what he does is he basically checks for the balance. Does the customer has the balance or not? If he has it, he basically locks that uh, particular row using the transaction, okay? And then the same thing happens um, with the coordinator when, when the coordinator talks to the order of microservices as well. He will basically check if that particular order exists um, in the inventory or not. If it is, it will basically block that particular order for himself. And then both of the services basically reply to the coordinator that, yeah, okay, we have prepared. So this is the call which basically says that we have prepared by the customer wallet and also by the order that, okay, have prepared the order. So now the coordinator will be basically waiting for two different calls because it knows that I have made a request to two microservices. One is customer, one is order microservices. So he will be waiting until um, two callbacks or two responses. If, for example, if the order response took some time to reply, then the coordinator will not do anything um, but wait. Uh, as soon as he gets um, two calls, he will basically continue with the second uh, phase of the, you know, uh, two-phase commit. The second phase of the two-phase commit is commit. So in this case, um, once successfully prepared, the coordinator basically asks the customer wallet and also the order uh, microservices to start commit. What that means, it basically giving the confirmation that, yeah, you guys can go ahead and commit whatever you guys have prepared or locked. Then the two calls will be basically placed. One is commit wallet and then commit order. Both will basically commit it at this point of the time. And then they both have to respond it back to the coordinator saying that, did we successfully commit it or not? So in this case, both uh, sent back the reply that, yeah, okay, commit. And also this guy replied back to the coordinator that, okay, we ordered. So this complete cycle finishes of the you know, distributed transaction using two-phase commit. We'll have to look into the failure scenarios. So, so the first case will be, for example, what if the user doesn't have sufficient balance? In that case, the customer wallet should basically throw an error. So what happens is the coordinator, when he makes a call, prepare wallet, basically this one, the customer wallet microservices basically try to check uh, whether the customer has enough balance in his wallet. If he doesn't have, basically in this phase itself, he starts to throw an error. How? Basically, he basically responds but it's not an okay preparation, uh, okay prepare, um, but instead it will be throwing an error. And as soon as the coordinator sees an error from the you know, uh, customer wallet microservices, the whole process will be aborted. And that's how the distributed transactions basically handle the failure in case of prepare wallet. And the same goes with prepare order as well. If um, the order is not there in the inventory, basically in the first step itself, the uh, transaction will be aborted. For some reason, um, after prepare statement, if there are any errors, then also there are possibilities that the whole transaction process might ab might abort. Um, say in case the customer had the sufficient balance and in the inventory we had the uh, order. So in that case, the prepare phase will succeed with okay preparation and okay preparation by the order. So now basically um, the coordinator tells customer wallet service and order services to commit it. When both guys try to commit, if there is some inconsistent value for some reason, just for, for example, then definitely the error will be thrown at this stage. And again, the transactions will get aborted. So how exactly the isolation is provided here? Because as I mentioned, in the prepare stage itself, basically both will lock uh, their respective rows uh, using their local transactions so no other uh, you know request will basically uh, can modify the same row which is locked so in case of here if you are modifying id 7 so in that case in the prepare stage itself the customer wallet for id 7 is completely locked and order um, for uh, id 7 is also locked um, so no other um, you know concurrent a request will not modify the wallet. Um, they have to wait until this transaction, uh, you know, returns the lock. 
So that's how the isolation is also provided. And the whole thing is kind of behaving uh, as a proper transactions in distributed environment. So the only important thing we need to remember is we need to definitely have a timeout because uh, say, for example, uh, the, the coordinator should definitely have a timeout. Why? Because he sent a message, prepare wallet, prepare wallet to both of the services. What if these guys never returned OK for prayer message? Um, then it's, it doesn't mean that coordinator should keep on waiting. Um, so he has to abort the whole transaction. So we also need to set some timeout values uh, for you know basically waiting timeout to make this thing work properly. What are the advantages and disadvantages? So the advantage is it is definitely a strong, consistent model of distributed transaction. Okay, but the problem here is if you see. Um, it is the coordinator who is basically handling all of these uh, microservices, and that's kind of bad. And also, if you see in the from the prepare statement, uh, the resource is kind of held up or locked since all of these dialogues are or the talking is happening over HTTP. So that that's kind of slow as compared to the other database transaction. So these locks are kind of held up for so long time uh, that it kind of causes a lot of latency in the system. And that is the one important reason why people doesn't suggest uh, to use two-phase commit um, in case of microservices. So the two-phase commit has strong consistency, but there are some serious problems with the way it works. And that actually makes the uh, development, uh, developing this particular uh, protocol a little more tedious job. Say for example, uh, let's go one by one. What happens if the coordinator fails at this stage? We have just created the transaction ID and the coordinator fail. What happens to the whole procedure of distributed transaction? We don't know, right? So what happens if for some reason, the node didn't even respond back when the coordinator sent a prepare message, the coordinator will be keep on waiting, uh, hoping that the order microservices will respond to me. But what if this particular microservice is down and he never responds back? So the coordinator neither can't abort or uh, you know commit. He has to just keep on waiting. And that is the reason why I mentioned you have to have timeout uh, to not to happen this way. So the, the, some of the other resources will be held um, until um, this guy uh, returns an OK proposition message. But since this service is And this is the extension of the two-phase commit called as three-phase commit in which one extra step is included called as pre-commit step. And having this pre-commit step basically help us to recover in the case of coordinator failure or participant failure or both. Um, the participators can be one or more. Um, those are the different microservices or different nodes which are actually participating in case of uh, for three-phase distributed commit. And the coordinator um, in the three-phase commit, the advantage is coordinator can be anyone, as I have earlier explained, by leader election, any node or any participator can become a coordinator. And also the advantage is because of the pre-commit, any coordinator uh, which takes over the failed coordinator can start from the middle by understanding the state of pre-commit. So in three-phase, the first stage is called as can commit, in this case, the coordinator basically understands how many participants are there. And um, so it basically sends a request called as can commit and all of the participants would reply as yes or no or whatever. So that's the first phase. Um, and then in the pre-commit phase, this is where the coordinator basically tells to lock or you know uh, to prepare the data uh, to start the commit procedure. And then once the acknowledgement is received from all of the participators, which uh, the count we got from the uh, first step, so the coordinator waits for all of the participators to reply to the, uh, by acknowledgement. And then it basically uh, um, calls every participator to do commit and then waits for all of the committed acknowledgements. So this is how the three-phase commit works. It is somewhat similar to two-phase. Uh, it's just that one, pre-commit stage is added, and I'm gonna tell you how exactly this stage helps you to uh, take over when some uh, you know, coordinator or participator fails.
So let's see how three-phase commit helps us to recover from the state where the earlier coordinator died and uh, um, how new coordinator will exactly take over the, that state. The new coordinator definitely needs to talk to all of the participators to understand the state. Say, for example, if the coordinator, uh, when the coordinator talks to participator, if at least one participator says that I have the do commit uh, you know, message received, that means that for sure the new coordinator can guess that the old coordinator was definitely ready to issue a do commit and hence the coordinator can take over from there by issuing do commit to all of the participants and commit it. For some reason, if none of the participants says that I haven't received pre-commit, that means that for sure the new coordinator can guess that none of the participants uh, participators would have committed the data. So. That means that we can either start from pre-commit stage or we can start over from the can commit uh, to understand how many participants are there and then the pre-commit stage will continue and all of the data will stay consistent. We learned two-phase commit, three-phase commit and also dynamic way of choosing coordinator and all of that. They are good. These procedures works well and they are strong consistent. But the only drawback is they are synchronous and also they take, take a lot of you know, time, that means that increase in the latency. This is also a widely used pattern called as Saga, and this works asynchronously. That means that we can implement this kind of pattern when we have um, web sockets or long polling, or even in case of polling as well, uh, it's up to us to choose what kind of technology, but it works well with the asynchronous way of sending the messages between client and the servers. But nevertheless, um, the how, how this pattern works is it, the series of microservices basically talks to each other using messages over event bus or queuing systems. Um, let's, take, let's take the same example of placing an order in Amazon or in an e-commerce site. How does it work? When the user places an order, um, the request actually lands up to order MS, or it could be vice versa. Let's take, uh, it came to the uh, first microservice called as order microservice. In this case, the order microservice basically checks uh, the inventory. If it has the uh, product which the user is requesting for, he basically adds a message called as order created into this queue or it's an event bus, uh, let's, let's take this as a simple queue. It adds that message over here. And then when the customer wallet microservices is free, it basically picks that message and then processes uh, by deducting the, the respective amount from the wallet. So if all goes well, everything is succeeded. So the whole cycle is kind of finished. What if for um, some reason, if the customer does, didn't have enough money in his wallet, then this guy will add a message to a different queue, basically. Basically, we need to roll back the order which is placed, right? So in that case, we'll have one more queue, um, maybe, maybe somewhere here. So we have one more queue. So, so basically, this customer wallet will add a message called as roll rollback order or something like that. So if basically for any actions, we need to add a message to the queue and there is a respective microservice which basically takes care of that. So when this customer wallet microservices fails, it adds a message called as rollback order. This message will come and land up into this queue. And then there is a microservice which basically takes care of customer uh, wallet rollback microservices and this will basically does the rollback of order and everything. So there need to be a lot of microservices to take care of different kind of um, actions. And all of these actions are basically transferred through the queue or event buses. And hence, there is a, and hence it is a synchronous way and it is a little faster compared to uh, the two phase and three phase because uh, we aren't using a lot of uh, logs over here and all of the transaction is local transaction with respect to those microservices. So when it place the order, there will be a transaction inside this microservices, not the transaction on all of the microservices unlike uh, the two phase and three phase. Uh, that's why it is much faster and asynchronous. 
and also how isolation is provided. Since any order um, requests are going through the event buses, all of the messages are sequential in here. And that's the reason why the microservices will not get the uh, multiple requests at a given point of time. You can scale these microservices into uh, horizontal horizontally, and uh, these microservices basically receive the sequential messages, and hence there will not be a you know isolation problem um, at all. So the complete atomicity will be still provided using this way. So I think that's it. Um, this kind of pattern works well as well. I think uh, I have covered uh, different ways of uh, handling transaction in distributed systems. Basically, microservices is one good example for the distributed systems. Um, I hope I have covered all of the information. Um, so if you like this video, please do subscribe to my channel. And uh, if you guys have a new topic, please do write that as well in the comment. I will make a new video on that. Um, I think, yeah, that's it. Um, do like this video and share with your friends. Thanks a lot.